extend a hand of blessing toward baby Mina and the family. In the name of Jesus, uh, I just bless you, uh, Mina, to be uh, a child of the airy places, uh, of the places uh, that are uh, lighthearted and undefined, where your powerful joy and creativity will build beautiful testimonies to God's kingdom. In Jesus' name, I bless you with the skills of a storyteller, as the storytellers of old and the storytellers of legend, and you will have ample stories to tell. Father God, we pray for an increased portion of your Holy Spirit, uh, your presence and provision for the Mitsudas. We pray, Lord, um, that uh, as they raise their family, uh, you would uh, see to their every need and give them their every direction. I mean, in Jesus' name, we dedicate you and accept you as your extended family in Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody says a big amen. There she is, guys. Good job. What a sweet spirit, huh? Good job, guys. And then our second baby you saw just recently. The Anagrans. Hey, Mom. Nice to see you. And little baby Emmanuel. Hoa Makua Kealoa is his middle name, right? I don't know what that means. Uh, it reflects a prayer that we have for him. Um, Mo actually, Moani helped us out with it. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's that he would be becoming a caretaker in love. Or that he would choose love as his father. And we know that like God is love. caretaker of love, yeah. That's great. Kahu Moani Sitch to help with that name. Well, he's a pro on stage. So extend of hand your blessing toward this family. Oh, baby... Manu, in Jesus' name, Manuel, we accept you as your extended family in Christ and dedication before the Lord for your purposes before the Lord. And I, I, just, I just bless you as a child of broad and soaring wings. Uh, I just bless you uh, as a child of the Lord who will travel exceptionally far um, across the earth and above the earth uh, to transcend uh, in the spirit uh, anything that is royal, roiling on the, on the earth. I bless you as a child of big, big wings. In the name of Jesus, uh, I bless you as a child of the Sabbath, even now, uh, that your rest would be supernatural and consistent and that you would spread the spirit of Sabbath and rest wherever it is that you live in this world. Uh, we accept you as your family in the name of Christ. In Jesus' name, everyone says, Amen. There he is. He's just totally chilling up there. This is his element. Yeah. He's going to stay up for the sermon. I wasn't satisfied at all with that aggressive waving. I don't think you really were aggressive enough. So let's do it again. Uh, two hands as hard as you can. Everybody wave at each other. Go. All right, all right. I will accept that. And I like the way you did it in complete silence, which blesses my introverted heart. Uh, way to go. Um, as we uh, 
get started this morning. We always like to, to make space for 90-second testimonies. Uh, people just come up and, and tell stories. And uh, I got some encouraging notes from Vern uh, this week, our um, uh, justice minister at the church. Can I ask her to come up and just give a quick report about things that she's seen in the justice ministry by way of encouraging stories? Go ahead, Vern. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's been a really interesting week. I See, it was May that we gave an update, which was very exciting. Lots of things going on, and one of the things that we shared was that we weren't sure how to get to particularly adult victims that weren't accessible because we weren't seeing them like we normally would. Uh, because of the shutdown, because everything because was shut shutdown, down. And, and there's not as many tourists, so there's not as many people on the streets. And so, anyway, it was challenging. So we were like, we don't know what you're doing, God. You're just going to have to bring them to us or give, this a great, give us a great idea. So June has been really interesting. I think um, in the course of about 11 days, there was 15 um, crisis calls that come into the, um, to the crisis line for human trafficking. There was adults like escaping every day, like new referrals and things like that. So literally people like breaking out of houses, like running down the street, like finding police officers. All so this say kind of breaking stuff. out of houses, breaking out of houses where they are essentially captive and yeah. sold out of. Yeah, so it's, I mean, usually the like whole locked in a house or like tied up or restrained, that's more Hollywood than it is like reality. There's more like manipulation. But the past couple of weeks have really uh, escalated or something where, you know, victims are literally, that were kept, were literally breaking free. So God. it was incredible. So I think we currently have 11 requests for housing for different individuals, which is a lot. So uh, that's very different than previous years. And this is in less than a two week period. So one of the things Blue Water does is the churches provide hospitality, provide uh crisis housing and stuff like that. Uh, so what would be like one need that we could help you with today? Um, one need that you could help, well, you know, I feel like that God's bringing the captives out, like he's freeing them. And so we need to be praying to just respond to what it is that he's doing, you know, and respond yeah. in whatever way we are to be part of that provision, which our legacy at Blue Water has always been to provide housing. And so we... Do, I feel like it's also miraculous that we had a couple of rooms at least opening up or people willing to try, but just a couple of rooms uh, is fantastic and it feels miraculous, but then it's also like, okay, but what about all the rest of them? So we just need to pray into like, God, how do we respond to the provision um, of God's people? You know, how do we respond as God's people to being a part of providing the needs of those that he is breaking free and see what he's doing in this new season. And so volunteers would be helpful. Um, we need like some extra twin beds for the rooms that we do have. Of course we need more rooms, but we do need some extra twin beds and like bedding and you know essentials like that where we are helping people start their lives over. So you could contact us at justice at bluewatermission.org. That's the email address, or you can find me around service afterwards. So you can volunteer yourself for general labor. You can volunteer mm -hmm. bedding or just life essentials. That yeah. would be helpful. And uh, maybe uh, housing or a room, if you happen to have that and feel so led by the Lord in your prayers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, we're just like a blow-up mattress and a sheet would be a great place mm -hmm. to start. Like, it's really just trying to respond and meet the need whatever way we can. I've got a very quick question for you. I actually remember the time when we started out on this as, as we were planning the church, just like 11, 12 years ago, God was speaking to a bunch of people simultaneously, do something about human trafficking around here. Yeah. And your first response was to do what? Well, I went down the Waikiki and I just sat and watched and interacted. Like I just decided to put myself in the middle of it. And then it took maybe nine months before of praying before we started seeing victims coming out. And then at that point, I just took them home. You just, <laughs> you just went down to Waikiki and hung out. Yeah. And then when God started bringing them from there, you just took them home. Yeah. Yeah. When God started bringing them out, then I just started taking them home because I felt like 
you know, they're the widows and the orphans, so how can I call myself a Christian if I don't do something and respond to them? That's all I wanted to hear. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. See, Vern, if any of that uh, plugs out your heart, yeah? It's the Spirit leads. All right, we are in a sermon series about how Jesus did it, how Jesus changed the world. How many of you want to change the world? Raise a hand. Wave it at me. I know that your muscles are already warmed up. Good. Um, and uh, the notion of the sermon series is that if you want to change the world, hey, why not try to change the world as Jesus changed the world? Because he was clearly the most changeful person who ever lived uh, in the history uh, of the planet. Um, I love... I love uh, well, I love the justice ministry for all sorts of reasons and other things that we do like that around the church. I appreciate a great deal. Uh, I love what um, the, that justice team does with uh, human trafficking victims and survivors, uh, taking them from one state of life to another. I mean, really, it's changeful, right? Um, and you might describe that sort of ministry as... Well, you might call it justice ministry, you might call it social justice, you might call it outreach, you might call it evangelism. But as I think about it, I, I see it chiefly as a ministry of accessibility. It's making something accessible to these survivors that would not otherwise be accessible. And the something, of course, that we're making accessible, accessible is, well, what? I mean, love, you know, some practical resources, of course, a relationship uh, with the Lord, ultimately, which is a great key uh, to being free consistently uh, in, in this life. Uh, but it's the accessibility that I think is, is, the, is the key. It's what makes what Vern and, and the team, uh, what, what makes what they do so unique. Because Everyone is pro-justice, am I right? Everyone is pro-outreach, am I right? I mean, everyone, if you're a believer, you're pro-evangelism, am I right? But not everyone makes that stuff accessible. That's the key. That's the doorway. Jesus described himself as a gate. My job is to make things accessible. And we asked Vern, well, how did you start? Well, I went down to Waikiki and I hung out until something happened. <laughs> uh, and then I, I made the most of it. And uh, as she was talking, that story popped into my head uh, because I was thinking about uh, a saying that you regulars, you regular, your veteran ministry leaders have almost certainly heard me say over the years. One of my favorite sayings is, ministry is 80% hanging out waiting for something to happen. It doesn't matter if that's sitting in Waikiki uh, and waiting until uh, the sex workers get to know you a little bit or uh, hanging out with an individual that you want to care for one-on-one. -on -one. Ministry is 80% hanging out and just waiting for the opportunities uh, to open. Um, do you know the, the origins of that phrase, hanging out or to hang out? Do you know where that comes from? I thought I knew, and I looked it up this week uh, just to make sure. It's really interesting. During the 1400s, the phrase dates back to the 1400s. People first started using the phrase to hang out. And what it referred to originally was shopkeepers. When they went to a new place, they would hang out a shingle, which is another phrase. They would take a wooden shingle of the sort that you might use on a rooftop to shingle your roof, uh, but that's, that shingle became their business sign. And then they would write their business on it, you know, like Jordan Sang, you know, pastor, or Jordan Sang, agitator. I don't know what my business is. Um, you know, dentist, barber, whatever it happened to be, saloon keeper. Uh, because, you know, buildings tended to look the same. And then you would hang out your shingle. And then people would say, oh, where does Jordan hang out? Where does he do his business? Where does he make what he does accessible to the world? And that's where the phrase comes from, from hanging out a uh, shingle. And then over the centuries, 
Uh, it has been used remarkably consistently, and every generation does a twist on it. When we say, hey, you want to hang out? You want to hang out together? Like, well, do you want to be, do you want to make one another accessible to each other? You know, we don't, that's a mouthful. So we just say, do you want to hang out? Uh, where's your hangout? You know, where, where, where do you, where do you reside typically? It's a great, it's a great phrase, is it not? Just give me like an ooh, or that's interesting, or something. I think that's fascinating. That's really my best point of the morning, so if that doesn't charge you up, Thank you. Seriously, people. Hang out. I have just infused the phrase hang out with eternal meaning. I need a better hangout. That's what I need. In some ways, I think hanging out is the core of Jesus' strategy to change the world. I think more than anything else, Jesus' strategy to change the world boils down to hanging out. In both the narrow and fuller sense that um, I've already discussed in this series on how Jesus did it. How did Jesus change the world? Well, Jesus showed up and, and hung out. He made himself accessible and thereby made accessible that which he carried knowledge and love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our uh, scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 9. This is kind of a sermon on, on what might typically be called evangelism or outreach. Uh, and this is one of two stories in the Gospels that I think are really iconic. Like they're, It's one of two stories that people really think of when they think of Jesus doing outreach and Jesus doing evangelism. Uh, one of the stories is the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where Jesus is hanging out at a well. This woman of ill repute comes up. They have a conversation, ends up sort of bringing her to faith, and she evangelizes her entire village. And it's just a beautiful, elegant story uh, centered around this gorgeous, brilliant conversation that Jesus has with this woman that he just met. This very inappropriate but lovely conversation. Uh, and then this one is the calling of Matthew, which everybody knows. Matthew ended up being one of Jesus' chief disciples, one of the 12 apostles. And Matthew, what did he do for a profession? Sunday school Bible quiz. He was a tax collector, uh, which in those days meant that he was an extortionist. He was a mafia bag man. Um, he made his money by taking Roman taxation uh, from his Jewish compatriots and then he would take a little extra to line his pockets. That's how they made a living. Uh, and so this is a story of how Jesus approached this figure, this guy named Matthew, and sort of brought him into the fold, so to speak. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. It was Matthew's hangout. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Well, that's nice decision-making. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You can see why it's such a, an iconic story of evangelism. Thanks, honey. Um, there are tons of hanging out. There's tons of hanging out in this passage, right? Uh, Matthew is at his hangout where he has hung out his shingle. Tax collector, extortionist. And so Jesus goes to his hangout. And, and that's how Jesus finds him. That's how Jesus locates him. Jesus had probably seen him hanging around the fringes of the crowd before then. And something leads Jesus to be like, yeah, I'm going to go hang out with this guy. And they decide from there to hang out together. When Matthew makes the decision to follow Jesus, well, they immediately go to Matthew's crib. That's lingo, by the way. They go to Matthew's crib. They go to Matthew's house. And they have a huge hangout because, you know, Matthew's house is his other hangout, right? And so all of Matthew's friends come over, and they're kind of dubious friends. They're other tax collectors. They're other mafiosos, in other words. And, you know, a lot of other 
sinners, which is code for, you know, people who make their living in disreputable ways and are obviously disreputable morally. So, you know, a lot of probably, you know, loose women and licentious people and stuff like that. I'm sure they had their, um, their entourages, uh, shall we say. And the religious folks get upset at Jesus is hanging out. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, and Jesus says this very famous line, I didn't come to, you know, call the healthy but the, the sick. I mean, like, if I'm going to change the world, you know, it's not about making healthy people healthy. It's about making sick people healthy. It's not about making righteous people righteous. It's about making lost people found. It's about making sinful people f into free people, you know. Uh, and so Jesus kind of defines his mission right then and there. It's like, no, I came precisely for this. Now, if you were one of the Pharisees, you were one of the religious people there, and Jesus said, this is why I've come, right? This is the whole mission. And then you moved your eyes from Jesus, and you looked at this party, this hangout that he was part of. What would you have thought about his mission? How would you have described it to him, to yourself? You came to party with the disreputable crowd? You, you came to kick back with simple people? This, this is how you define ministry? And then, you know, what Jesus said to them at that point was, well, I've heard it on good authority that 80% of ministry is just hanging out and waiting for something good to happen. That's probably what he said, right? You're a little slow this morning, people. Yeah, I was like, I, I came to hang out with people. I came to be accessible to people and to make everything that I have accessible. And I need to find a way to maximize the accessibility in my life. You follow me? That's what I'm saying. It's not, it's not a hard point, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure that, you, that you get it. Um, there's this lovely line about mercy, which is really one of my favorite lines in all of the Gospels. He says, go find out what this means. And he quotes from an Old Testament prophet. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And they would have recognized the quotation from the Old Testament. And they would have understood that it meant, like, it's not about sacrificing to God. It's not about sacrificing bulls and lambs. And it's not about tremendous worship services and, and going through the rituals at the temple which you guys are good at, but that's not really the main point. Mercy is the main point, and it has been all along. It's not about making a way to God with your sacrifices and religious rituals. What this is about is God making a way to you with mercy, right? Mercy is when you're forgiven, when you are released from the bad things that you deserve, and perhaps when you are offered good things that you don't deserve. In Jesus's frame, God was the way maker, right? We don't need religious observance to make a way to God, God has made a way to us. God is hanging out with us. God, is, God has done the hangout, right? He's not hard to find. He hung out a shingle, you know? You get the point. It's like, you religious people have misunderstood accessibility in a terrible way, and you have declared these people have no accessibility to God. You have declared God inaccessible to the sinners and the thieves and the extortionists and the ruffians. Uh, I want no part of that. I want to hang out with the sick people. All right, that's not a, that's not a hard sermon to preach at, at Blue Water, you know, because we all understand the value of mercy. We all understand the mercy of grace, right? And let's face it, we are the disreputable crowd, many of us. I'm not going to name names, but uh, just look to the side and glare at somebody disreputable right now, if you would, you know, somebody around, because they know, they know, and just say, I know that you're there, but I love you anyway, even though you're a little stinky. 
Yeah, we're in it together. We're in it together. <clears throat> Don't take this the wrong way, but, uh, you know, we always talk about the cross. Kind of a big deal in human history. Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross. And uh, I, I think sometimes religious people are inclined to misunderstand what Jesus hanging on the cross is. Jesus hanging on the cross was God's ultimate hang out. You know, I don't mean to be disrespectful when I use that phrase to describe Jesus on the cross, but in a way, it was God hanging out a shingle and saying, open for business. I mean, this is where I can be found. More than that, I can be found in a big way. I mean, I'm not holding anything back, people. I mean, this is mercy. This is grace. This is the opposite of you have to get the religious rituals and sacrifices and behaviors right if you want to find God. No, this is God hanging out with you to the ultimate degree. God's ultimate hangout. Where does God hang out? God hangs out in a really lowly, accessible, sacrificial place. Uh, and that's where he does business there. Super easy to find. Super easy to find. We said a few weeks ago, God is easy to find. He might be hard to follow, but dang, he is easy to find. And anyone can get access to God at any time. That's how Jesus did it. Jesus changed the world through accessibility. Are you following me so far? Are you follow it? Everybody just sort of clap your hands. I'm going to bring it now to the big finish, to the big finish, the application point. Uh, how did Jesus change the world? Well, he changed the world by being accessible. He changed the world by hanging out and uh, figuring out where people hang out and just generally making himself accessible so that he can make God accessible. My question to you. If I needed to find you, if I needed accessibility to you, brothers and sisters, if I needed to find God through you, how would I do it? Where's your hangout? Have you hung out a shingle? Have you made your ex yourself accessible to problematic people like me. Are you accessible or not? Are you open for business in the Jesus changed the world sense? Or are you closed for business? Oh, I thought about this so often during the past 18 months of shut down, of closed down. You know, it's so provocative, right? I want to be shut down. I want to make myself more open than ever. I want to hang out. So like a lot of churches, we've invented new ways to be accessible and to hang out. But are, are you accessible? Are you accessible? Or is your week just, you know, just so full of stuff, you know, you spend all your time in closed spaces. Could I find you if I needed to find you? Could I find you if I didn't already have a big claim on your life? Because that's 80% of what Jesus did. Is being findable. And to me, that's evangelism. To me, that's outreach. It's not, you know, four spiritual laws that you preach when you have a moment of throwdown. It's like, can you be found? Can you find other people? Where, where do you do that business in your life? Do you understand the question at least? Are you an accessible person? Because if you're not an accessible person, then you're not being salt, you're not being light, and you're not changing the world. I'll tell you that. And then you're missing out on something. You're missing out on, on life purpose. Um, think hard about this for a moment, if you please. I'll just give you 30 seconds. How could I find you if I didn't know you and needed to find you? You know what I mean, right?
can ask a couple subsidiary questions. Uh, if you have a job, can people at your workplace find you open for business? I know they can find you at your desk or whatever, but can they find your place of business? You know what I mean? Can they uh, do spiritual business with you? Are you open with them about it? Or maybe it's at school. How about your neighbors? Do your neighbors know? Sometimes to be an open person, you have to go hang out with them, right? You have to show up at their place of work, which is what Matthew did. Excuse me, what Jesus did with Matthew, went to his place of business and said, hey, let's go do something. Follow me. Jesus butted in. Hang out with me today. Let's do dinner. Sometimes at Blue Water, we use that phrase, Matthew party. You guys remember that phrase? Well, this is the story from whence it comes. When you have a Matthew party, you just invite people and mix it up, right? Maybe one of them is interested in Jesus. Maybe some of them know Jesus. Maybe a lot of them don't know Jesus. And you hang out. And you be very open. And you see what happens. And that's 80% of anything right there. That's it. That's hanging out a shingle, a Matthew party. We have another saying that we say a lot. I think Antonio might have coined this one. Uh, maybe it was me. I don't know. We have so many great ideas, Antonio. It was... Uh, a meal plus one significant question is a kingdom event. You know, you hang out, you eat uh, Ariel's cupcakes with somebody, and you ask them one significant question. What would be an example of a significant question? Pop quiz, Blue Water. What's God saying to you lately? Or if you're talking to a, a total non-believer, how would you phrase it? What's really important to you lately? That always leads to an interesting place. All right, you have the point for this Father's Day sermon. We just have to be accessible people. We have, to, we have to hang out, folks. Let's hang out sometime. Every Sunday, let's get together and hang out and do business. Let's hang out in our Ohana groups, you know, whether they're in person or online. Let's hang out at work. Let's hang out at school. Let's hang out. Let's let it all hang out, all the important stuff, and let's see what happens from there. And then when something happens, you know, you're the gate, maybe you take them home with you, so to speak. Uh, Father God, I pray that you would make us extremely accessible people. I pray that Blue Water would ever and always master the art of the hangout. Uh, I pray that it would empower our fellowship to do great and wondrous things. I pray, Lord, that wherever we hang out, Jesus, you would join us. And that we would have beautiful, inappropriate, glorious stories as a result. In Jesus' name, everybody says...